All right, let's get our program started. Uh, good morning again to everyone. Thank you for being here today. Uh, my name is Dr. Cheryl Richards. I have the privilege of serving as the president and CEO of Catapult, which is your employer's association. And we're thrilled today to bring you one of our Thinking Differently series um, on building your culture. We have some great uh, panelists that will be joining us today. Deborah Punky is Chief Human Resource Officer at Concord Hospitality, and two of my colleagues at Catapult. Kirsten Laura serves as our Vice President of Learning, and Becky Drodes serves as our Director of Total Rewards Solutions. And collectively, the three of them have some great ideas um, to share with us about how we might go about building culture. So before we jump into the program, let's talk a little bit about Catapult as your employer's association. Our mission is to provide you and your employees with the confidence to navigate everyday operational challenges, making your workplaces more effective and your employees more successful. We exist to accelerate a world of exceptional workplaces where engaged people drive that business success. And I can't think of any better topic than one on culture to talk about engaging people in their workplace. We have a wonderful program, as I mentioned, that is planned today. And I'm going to introduce our first speaker and then I'll hold our two catapult speakers until after Deborah is finished. So let me provide a, a brief introduction to Deborah Punky, Chief Human Resource Officer at Concord Hospitality. She joined Concord Hospitality in 1994 and has made countless contributions to the company throughout her career. She has an extensive and successful background in operations, serving as Vice President of Operations from 2002 to 2007. During that time, Deborah opened a total of 17 hotels, including leading the charge of Concord's entry into Canada by opening five hotels in seven weeks. As Chief HR Officer, she oversees the hospitality culture, organizational growth strategies, and she champions human capital initiatives in the area of technology, talent acquisition, training, benefits, risk, and compliance. Deborah also leads Concord's public relations teams and efforts around sustainability, charitable giving, and wellness. She sits on advisory boards within Marriott and Hyatt and leads an annual benchmarking conference. She holds her Bachelor of Science degree in Business Administration from West Liberty University in uh, West Virginia. So Deborah, quite the background and we know um, working in the hospitality industry that culture counts and culture matters. So as we begin your program, I'd like to ask our team to start with our first poll question of our audience. And perhaps that will give you a sense of our audience and where they believe their culture is today. So for our, our audience, please respond to this quick poll question. How would you describe your culture today? We'll give that just a minute and then we'll kick it over to Deborah. <clears throat> All right, let's see the results of our poll. Um, looks like for the majority, vast majority of us, um, these are under development or undefined at this time. So you have fertile ground, Deborah, <laughs> uh, to begin uh, talking about your um, your session, and then maybe we can come to uh, to those who have high performing cultures and we'll see what they've done well. So the floor is yours. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you today and participate on this panel. Um, the subject of culture is one that is near and dear to my heart. So I'm grateful to share my passions around the topic. I should start by telling you a little bit about Concord Hospitality. We're a developer and manager of hotels. We were established in 1985 by founder and still CEO, Mark Laporte. We're headquartered in Raleigh, North Carolina, 
and we currently support the management of 147 hotels and nearly 6,000 team members across North America under the brands of Marriott, Hilton, Hyatt, and Cambria. I started just a short 28 years ago when we had two hotels, and I joined the company for advancement opportunities, but I quickly learned it was a company that I wanted to make a difference in. It was a company I wanted to be my best in and a company that I would retire in. But why? It was because of how the company made me feel each and every day. And to me, that's culture. Webster defines culture as characteristic features of everyday existence, a diversion or a way of life, people shared by people and in a place or time. But how do you build a culture? It was 10 years after our company was founded that we began writing down things like our mission, values, and philosophies. And when we did, it was a very natural and organic process because long before that time, we were living it. Let me explain that a little bit more. I would always hear our CEO say, I want our company to be the employer of choice. I want everyone to enjoy where they work. Well, hence our mission became to be a great place to work for all. Additionally, I would hear him talk about the importance of quality, integrity, community, profitability, and even fun. These then became our cornerstones. <clears throat> and of course, you cannot have a successful business without acting responsibly with regard to our environment and caring for people in need. Culture starts at the top and develops over time through the collective efforts of your team. <clears throat> it thrives when you consistently execute against your mission, vision, and values. Your company must have a clearly defined purpose and you have to communicate it to your people. We did this through the 564 program. <clears throat> we needed an easy way for all associates in Concord, no matter location or position in the organization, to understand what differentiates us from our competition. 564 clearly communicated our five cornerstones the six metrics for success, and the four global initiatives that make our world a better place. So why is sharing your company's philosophy so important to building a culture? We know that when people feel part of something that they believe in, they will act like owners. When people understand what is expected of them, they have a greater chance of achieving it. And we know that when a company genuinely cares about their teams, their communities, and the environment, people want to be part of that organization. It builds loyalty. So for Concord, 564 emphasized the importance of our guiding principles. It clearly stated expectations and measures of success. It tied global initiatives to having good corporate social responsibility. And it brings people together under common goals, increasing efficiency and optimal performance. It encourages individualism and celebrates richness diversity brings in our organization. Really simply, 564 communicates our cultural norms. So our business approach to culture is being relentless and consistent about everything we do. Here are some of the ways. We make recruiting a priority. We act urgently because if we don't, we lose the best candidates to someone else. We appreciate, our candidates appreciate the attention and care we give to the process. This is their first glimpse of our people first culture. We broaden our candidate pools by looking into HBCUs and retirees and community-based organizations, restaurants, churches, neighborhoods, dog parks. Our mantra here is always be recruiting and always share your company's vision and values. That creates advocates for your brand even before they begin to work for you. We create a memorable first impression. Every new hire in our company receives a warm welcome and an offer letter at their home. And managers get a leather bound portfolio housing their offer. 
we deliver an inspiring orientation and onboarding because statistics prove that if you have an effective program, 86% of people are likely to ramp more quickly to success in their positions and stay within your company. We've developed a turnkey program that everyone is required to follow, and that ensures consistency. We offer a mentor program and a training plan, and then have regular check-ins to ensure our new associates are enjoying their jobs. I can't stress it enough, but a well-structured process ensures that consistent messaging is being delivered and quickly immerses people into your culture. We engage every day. We enroll every new team member into our Beekeeper app. It's a Facebook-like app just for Concord. And we want to further engage with them and get to know them. And we want them to know our company and the people in the company. We share everything on Beekeeper. We lead by example in this area, interacting on the app as others then emulate. <laughs> we celebrate birthdays and anniversaries. Uh, we recognize achievements. We welcome new associates in hotels. We share family photos. We celebrate births and weddings and we honor those who have passed away. We use it as a tool for training, information sharing, and scheduling. Engagement strengthens your culture. Uh, we do offer opportunities for growth and, and development. We make it a mission to develop the people within our organization first. In our company, every new associate goes through training on day one, throughout the year, and annually thereafter. We've got an entire leadership development series. Leadership Development One is a course that's required for all new supervisors and managers in our company. Dynamic sales training is required for all new sales professionals. Professionals. We train on everything from time management to dining etiquette. Our Leadership Development Two program is for our emerging leaders. This helps our associates propel to the next level of leadership through mentoring. Leadership Development 3 is our orientation and onboarding for new leaders in our company, new higher level leaders, general managers, directors of sales, human resource leaders. They come to our home office in Raleigh on day one to meet and get to know the corporate team and the senior executives. And we offer internships and an MIT program because an investment in your people is an investment in your success. We care for people. Be there for your team members through thick and thin. My company saw me through the death of my parents, a divorce, breast cancer, a remarriage, and most recently, the near death of my husband. The entire company rallied around me, lifting me up, sending cards and letters to my husband, standing outside of his hospital room, cheering him back to life. That is genuine care. We also care beyond our own associates and their families. We've established a charitable, charitable mission to provide food and shelter, because that's what we do in business, for people in need in the communities where we live and work. And while our, our hotels have charitable activities throughout the year, on share day each year, we come together as an organization to give back in a big way. We serve 3,200 families, more than 67,000 meals. We rebuild a dozen homes. We pack hundreds of backpacks and volunteer 6,000 hours in one day across North America. <clears throat> and all of this is funded by our hotel's individual fundraising efforts to the tune of almost $200,000 a year. We're in a partnership with Clean the World an organization who recycles the used soap and shampoo from our hotels and distributes them as bars of soap to kids around the world who are dying of diarrheal diseases. That's hygiene-related diseases, completely preventable. Since the inception of the program in 2010, we have diverted 35 tons of waste from landfills, created nearly 1 million bars of soap, and they say we've saved an estimated 200,000 lives. What we do outside of the business connects people with purpose and it expands your culture. So we celebrate differences. 
Our associates represent 105 countries, and each one of the, them makes us a, a better company. It enriches us. Diversity, equity, and inclusion was part of our company long before it became a trend. By the way, in our company, it's diversity and belonging because that's what resonates with our team members. Our mantra is our biggest differences are our greatest strengths. We've established eight Concord employee resource groups to create awareness and compassion and bring unity amongst our teams. With the civil unrest of 2020, we didn't shy away. We took a stance to be leaders through an end racism campaign. Our CEO publicly did candid conversations with black leaders in our company, committing to increased diversity amongst senior leadership. Respecting and celebrating differences brings humanity to your culture and it lets it live in your people. We seek counsel from experts. We seek input on how to better operate the business from the boots on the ground, the people in our hotels. Every hotel has an associate advisory council, which guides the business to be their best. It removes obstacles to customer service. It helps support the team members going through trials. It creates opportunities for engagement and charitable giving. We also engage with advisory councils that vet new programs for us before we launch them. <clears throat> we gather input on what's working and what's not. Recognizing that you don't always know what's best injects humility and keeps your culture in check. So those are just a few ways that we've built a culture of care and concord. But then, enter 2020. Our company was humming along, we were growing, people were advancing, our culture was thriving, and then the pandemic hit. We lost 93% of our company's revenue overnight and 82% of our people. It was devastating, but it didn't stop us from doing what we knew helped our company thrive. In fact, we amped up our culture. We increased communication through Beekeeper. We, we kept people abreast of the state of the industry, the state of our company and their jobs. We continued benefits while they were laid off. We recognized all remaining associates in the business with a purple pineapple pin for courage, resilience and endurance through the pandemic. And along with my peers on the senior, senior leadership team, we delivered homemade chocolate chip cookies to 100 hotels to let them know we love them, we appreciate them, and all that they were doing in these extraordinary times. We started over, but because we had a proven roadmap for success, our culture continued to thrive. I would argue it even got better in the worst of times because we put people first through care, compassion, and transparent communications. If you want a roadmap for building a company's culture, here it is. Learn the history and what makes your company unique. Develop the mission, vision, and values that define your organization and communicate those to your team. Hire people who share your values. Make every day count, especially day one. Care for your employees beyond their work. Coach failures and celebrate successes. Make the difficult decisions and stand by them, even if you're standing alone. Share your company targets and results with your teams. Have fun and commit to what you will do consistently without fail. Create a culture that moves people toward you and not away from you. I think that probably sums up what we do in Concord and um, appreciate the opportunity to share. Deborah, that is amazing. Wow, you have me, uh, my, my notepad is full. Um, <laughs> I've been jotting notes over here and what an inspiring story. And I love the way that you started out um, with you know joining Concord Hospitality was not just a job. You you were committed from the beginning to make it the place you were going to retire from. 
Um, so I can't help but wonder, you know, your parents probably instilled some of that drive in you. Um, what was one of the lessons that your parents taught you that you still carry with you today? Sure, I'll, I'll give you two of them. My father always said, you know, work hard, put your head down, have a great admiration for what you do, and you'll be successful. People will notice. And I did. But then my mother, I think, was the most compelling. She said, tell me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. It's the same in business. You have to align with a company and a culture that shares values or it doesn't work. You can't force it. It has to feel natural. Yeah, that is um, great advice from parents um, and uh, I think has certainly served you well. We'll talk a little bit later about some of the points you, you touched on around the mission, vision and values and some of that work that we've also done at Catapult um, when we bring our, our colleagues on there. Um, I want to ask you before I transition to that, I think what's unique about your story and the journey that you've had in your career is that um, the pandemic hit everyone extremely hard, right? And we knew that, but it hit hospitality mm -hmm. um, probably harder than any other industry. Um, at the time, I was the president of Johnson & Wales University, and I know um, we struggled with telling students, you know, how do you find employment in an industry that has essentially been decimated? And, and you referenced losing 82% of your people and 93% of your revenues. So you had to rebuild culture, right? Because you had lost so many people and bring new people in. So how did you think about keeping that culture thriving coming out of the pandemic? I, as, I, as I mentioned, I think the fact that we stayed so engaged with our team members who remained, the mere 1,000 associates out of the six, um, we engaged even higher than, high, more so than what we did at any other time. Uh, we walked with them in the battle. We supported them. That created a foundation that spoke to new candidates that said, hey, this is who we are genuinely, and we want you to join our company. We want to walk with you just like Concord walks with us in the business. And it made it really simple for us to recruit folks back because they saw firsthand what we did in the, in the heat of the pandemic, in the throes of the difficult times. If you stand by your people through good and bad, they're gonna stand by you and they're gonna be your best testimony and advocates of your brand. Yeah, I think uh, you couldn't say that any better, um, particularly coming out of the pandemic. We know, uh, we've heard from our employers at Catapult that um, it's, a, it's the people's market right now, right? Employees get to choose where they want to work. And we know that um, culture is a huge part of that. You also mentioned a couple things um, in your uh, opening remarks about the people first culture, um, investing in people, um, investing in their leadership development. And I thought that was a great segue uh, for me to bring on two of my colleagues um, to talk about um, ways that organizations can invest in their people as well. So let me do uh, introductions here. Uh, first of Kirsten Laura. Kirsten serves as our Vice President of Learning and Development at Catapult. She has spent almost three decades in the learning space, starting her career in higher education, as did I, um, and creating some of the first web pages for the University of Florida, which helped their professors. And then she later taught um, technical writing online and in person here in North Carolina at NC State. Um, over her career, she has helped academic institutions across the country as they moved and pivoted away from in person to online education, which was a culture shift. Her focus on corporate education has spanned every industry and every company size from sole practitioner CPA firms to Fortune 100 clients with global needs. She has led multi-million dollar portfolios and consulted with global clients on developing competency models, skill gap analysis, career pathing, and learning plans. 
at Catapult, we are delighted that Kirsten heads our learning department as we look to the future and we innovate new ways to support our members. So Kirsten, thank you for joining us. And Becky Droz is our Director of Total Rewards Solutions at Catapult. Becky is primarily responsible for advising companies in the area of compensation and benchmark data and tailoring compensation consulting services to meet the needs of the member. Uh, this includes, but isn't limited to, assessments and creation of salary structures, job analysis, and FLSA guidance. Becky earned her MBA from Marymount University and a Bachelor of Fine Arts from the University of Illinois. She has extensive experience in the areas of compensation, job analysis, organizational commitments, uh, communications, recruitment and retention, and employee relations. She is also a certified compensation professional and certified um, senior professional in HR. Uh, as well as uh, SHRM SCP. So Becky and Kirsten, thank you for joining the conversation. I'm excited to see where this goes as we build on uh, Deborah's platform that she's um, given us. But let's talk um, a little bit about some of the things that impact culture that you can't control, right? She's talked about the things you can control around mission, vision, values, but we've all just come out of a pandemic and we know that that was out of our control. So let's ask another poll question of our audience at this time. And that is, was your culture impacted by COVID-19? And if so, in what ways? So let me turn it to our events team to put our poll question up. We'll put this in progress. You may select one or more of the following. <coughs> watching the numbers just bounce around we're going to give it another minute because there's no clear uh winner i think we're covid has impacted us in all of these ways so let's give it just another minute All right, and with that, we have 75% of our poll in. Um, here are the results. So you can see a no clear winner, but it is definitely harder to retain and onboard employees. And it looks like um, many of you have looked more at training and development or learning and development opportunities, as well as reevaluating uh, total rewards. So that's a perfect segue. Um, for us to engage Becky and Kirsten in the conversation as well. So let's start off um, based on our poll question. Uh, it looks like more people need more, um, more tools in their toolkit to retain employees. And we know that that can um, relate to culture and how they're onboarded, but also their total rewards package and um, the company's commitment to invest in, um, in retaining those employees. So Kirsten, let me come to you and uh, let's start with a question. What's from your perspective, any tips for attracting or retaining employees? So we have a lot of members that are asking that question right now because everybody is on the hunt for the talent, right? And the talent has changed and what they want has changed. Um, I think that people are looking for a home. So Deborah talked about how, you know, she wanted to identify with some place where she knew she could actually spend a career. She could grow. They would invest in her. It would be a place that felt like your second family. We spend more time there than anything else, right? For a lot of organizations, they haven't considered that in market, right? They haven't really thought about like, well, who do we want to be out in the presence for employees. So now it's that moment of taking a look and saying like, okay, we have to actually define that. 
And then we have to make sure that we're investing in people. And some of the ways that I love that I've seen is helping people do things that might not just be on the job training. So we have a member who I think has done a phenomenal job. Um, they actually tricked out a truck, like put stickers on the side of it. It's their training truck. They drive it to different construction sites. They serve food. They do safety training. But they also do things like saving for your first house or why 401ks matter or, you know, how to pay taxes or whatever happens to be the topic of the day. Like, you know, mental health, safety, you know, things like that. But they're looking at the person as a whole because it is a member of their organization that's like a family to them. And they want to make sure that they're taking care of them more than just making sure that you know how to use the new technology on the job site or something like that. So really building those connections in the whole ecosystem of learning and development. Yeah. And Becky, I know we've um, talked a lot about the feedback from our members of um, compensation and total rewards as a part of this. Kirsten just referenced, you know, 401k plans. Um, we at Catapult have just initiated new 401k plans and 529 plans to help people save for their children's um, college education. What else do you hear, Becky, in the total rewards space that companies are using as levers to retain employees? Yeah, so Total Rewards is really a combination of all the things that we've been talking about today. So I know often when we hear Total Rewards, we think comp and Ben. And of course, that is a big part of it for people. There's actually a Pew study that came out earlier this year, and pay was too low as the top reason that U.S. workers quit. So we, we can't ignore that piece of it. But it's all of these other things that come into play as well. So it is the development. It's the performance management and recognition, as well as viewing people as a whole person, kind of that whole well-being perspective. And so I think when we talk about evaluating total rewards, we do have to look at the comp and benefits. You know, we can do these other things, um, but if it's not a great place, you know, and you're not getting pay or there's a lot of competition, you can get a couple dollars more down the road. We're competing against that. And the way to compete is to, one, evaluate. It doesn't mean that you have to go out and give everybody more money. That's not always the answer. But you need to know where you stand. You know, so that's where I think it's important to go out and do some benchmarking, see what is happening in the industry. Hospitality rates have been going up. We're seeing a lot more competition in a lot of the lower levels because there's a lot more opportunity. People are switching careers. They're looking at different types of work that they didn't look at before, mainly as comp as the driver. But then it's those other pieces that we bring in. You know, as Deborah was talking everything, I'm like, she's checking all my five boxes of what is total rewards. I'm like, yes, that is the whole package. That's doing all of those different things. With that Pew study I referenced, not only was the pay too low, but the second thing that we definitely talked about today, no opportunity for advancement. So leveraging total rewards in the sense of looking at advancement, that's also a way to help fill some of those gaps where you're having a hard time recruiting people. Look for people who, that have the capacity to grow and to learn and, and feed it to them and turn them into what you need. I want to reference one more piece of this study, and that's something that I think is also woven throughout all of this conversation. This is absolutely horrifying to me. So the, the number three reason that people have left their jobs is that they felt disrespected at work. If culture and respect don't work together, I don't know what, what else to even look at. It just it blew my mind when I saw number three is disrespect, because I think about the culture when we talk about creating that mission, that vision, and those values. Culture is the behaviors and the practices that support all of those things. You know, so certainly I don't know any employer that would say they, they don't want a culture of respect. So I think, you know, it's building all of those pieces when we look at total rewards and evaluating all of those parts together because they all have an influence on each other. Yeah, I think really well said. And, um, you know, Deborah referenced it in hers as well around some of the um, ERGs, the employee resource groups, right? Um, and, and I love what you said, you know, a strategy can't be just around diversity, equity, inclusion. You have to have belonging as part of it. And people have to see where they fit into the picture. Um, Kirsten, I know you've done a lot of work in this space, both around the DEI, but also around the career advancement opportunities um, for employers. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the struggles that organizations are seeing as they're they're trying to attract and then retain very diverse populations and give them some of those career um, progression pathways? Sure. I, I want to touch on what Becky just mentioned though, because that issue of respect in the workplace is one of the most 
prevalent things that we are having members say right now. So for anybody on the phone, if you're saying like, oh, we're kind of having problems or there seems to be more investigations going on or more incidents or whatever, there is a casualness that people developed. And I think it happened during the pandemic, but I think it also happened because of TikTok and social media and what people find amusing outside the job. So when they come into the job, they act in ways that we all cringe at. Um, some of the most popular programs that we're running right now are what I consider just respect and responsibility. It's anti-harassment. Like Becky helps me out on this all the time. And these are things that you're like, you want to hit your head against the wall. Like, why would you ever say that to somebody? Like, because it's obvious things, but people just are forgetting. So, you know, it is definitely something that people are, are struggling with. Um, I to jump in, sorry to interrupt, but just yeah. one more thought on that. You know, I think that while we would say, okay, we want to have a respectful environment, I think you, what we, what we tolerate, we promote. So when we think about culture, if we don't address the things that make us cringe and say, oh, I can't believe somebody's doing that. If we let it slide, then we perpetuate the issue. So I think that, you know, that's another piece of all that training that you're talking about is really to say, we've got to hold people accountable. And sometimes that means training not only contributors, but managers to behave differently with their peers outside the office, too. Like, you know, a lot of the times the folks that we work with in the classroom have been promoted from team leads or from the line up to supervisor. It's their first time. These are the beer buddies still like so they still want to go out and hang and everything like that. But all of a sudden their role is different and you can't like do the same things that you used to do because it does come back into the workplace and it it just makes it a lot harder and, and it's things that we haven't traditionally had to train on but it's becoming more and more obvious that we do. Um, for diversity, like I think that one of the things that organizations are really understanding that it is more than just saying we're gonna do some training. Diversity is something that you have to actually have be part of everything that you think about. So it has to be like, we have a thoughtful, right now, a lot of organizations, we have to have a, actually a thoughtful strategy. We have to understand where we're at. We have to figure out where we want to go. And then we have to figure out what's the plan of development. And that means we look at how we procure suppliers, how we look at our marketing materials, our sales teams, how we represent ourselves in photographs, in print, everything like that. But it's also then giving voices, right? So it's how do we encourage people within the organization to feel like they have a voice and, um, you know, using ways that they can connect with each other or teach um, and everything like that. So we see a lot of enablement activities. So I'm really happy when we go in and we do some of that more traditional training and it's part of a, a, a larger picture, but then they say, well, how can our managers follow up? Right? Because I want you to come to our little two hour session. And then I want you to say, what do I take from this? And next month, we lead the conversation that makes us uncomfortable and kind of cringy, but we're going to have it because we want the people here to understand how invested we are as leaders of hearing and making it a better environment for everybody. Yeah, I, I think, you know, that um, you hit on something really important and I want to jump over to Deborah to give you an opportunity to talk about the importance of ERGs, right? Because training is one thing, but then having a dedicated um, vehicle to sustain some of that conversation and training um, is equally as important. You want to share any examples that you have from Concord of how you've um, sustained culture uh, over the long haul? Yes, and Kristen, great, great point about it has to be thread through everything you do in the organization. It has to be part of your daily lives, your daily culture. So <clears throat> we started again, the mission includes for all because we believe that if people feel safe and free to be authentic in the workplace, they're gonna bring their best selves to work, which we know fuels innovation and optimal performance. So when you allow people to share their authenticities and who they are, and in our case, we do it through these resource groups. So we have everything from um, fitness to women, to pride, to heritage, um, eight different C groups, we call them. And I'll just use June as an example. June, we're celebrating Pride Month. So we have all kinds of activities going on throughout the organization around our LGBTQ community. People are aware, people are celebrating. There's a lot of love sharing. Um, it's also uh, Juneteenth. 
So we've got a great speaker on Thursday that's broadcasting across the organization to tell people about Juneteenth and to talk about what it means, how it, how it you know, why do we celebrate it? Um, and then we have activities and food that support that. Um, so really just taking the time to let people be themselves and celebrate who they are. Um, I think that's the best way to keep diversity alive in your organization. And by the way, we know there are huge benefits to having broader perspectives. Um, it only lends to your overall success. Yeah, I, I think that's great. Um, we uh, we at Catapult also just uh, did a whole series around um, Pride Month and um, Juneteenth. And then I also learned that it's Men's Health Month. And um, so that's great. And it's also Soul Food Month. So what a great way to bring a whole lot of, you know, uh, perspectives and um, and traditions into the workplace. Um, I, I want to put our team on the spot because you said something, Deborah, in your presentation around, I think it was called Beekeeper, mm -hmm. um, that was a, a new thing for us to learn. Uh, we at Catapult have recently rolled out Workplace, um, which is kind of like a Facebook for your employees and has you know, several affinity groups in it, what you're watching and your pets and celebrations and some of the things you mentioned, Deborah, in your mm -hmm. opening remarks around getting to know your colleagues. Um, I, I'm curious for all three of you, what difference you think technology has played in building culture, particularly coming out of the pandemic where there's this hybrid work culture. And so um, if anyone has, uh, this is a, a new question that you didn't prepare for, but it feels like it's really relevant here. So um, maybe Deborah, do you wanna speak a little bit first and then we'll roll Kirsten and Becky? Sure. Um, first of all, the engagement through the Beekeeper app just really heightened during the pan pandemic. It became our way to reach people um, like Zoom did and Teams and everything else. But I'll use an example. I, I made a post on Beekeeper for a hotel saying, you know, I'm excited to go to this hotel. I can't wait to see the team. And um, we have a surprise for you. Well, I immediately got a response from a gentleman I'd never met before from the front desk. And he said, Mrs. Punky, we're excited to see you. My name's Dwight. I can't wait to meet you. I walked in the hotel, Dwight was at the front desk. We immediately knew each other. It was such a great feeling to know that we connected through the technology. Um, I also think that technology, people will tell you all day long, well, I have a lot of folks that are not able to be on technology. Well, I would beg to differ. It is our responsibility as an organization to help people navigate life. And life today is on technology. We just have to show them how it works. And I, I know, and that's why we went from an application that didn't reach everyone. It only re reached people through email. Not everyone has email. We went to this application because it reaches you on your cell phone. Everyone has a cell phone. Okay, maybe there's one or two that don't, but let's manage the masses and not the exception. And let's help bring on those that aren't maybe as comfortable uh, because we know it's the way of the world. And again, um, helping your associates get engaged only makes their lives better and your company a greater place to work. Yeah, I totally agree that it is such a great vehicle to engage and connect, especially when we're working with hybrid teams or we're working across locations now or internationally or you know who knows what our work models are. Um, I think that I probably am, like, I love technology, but I'm probably also still a, like, the human skills are the most important. I don't care if you're connecting in person or if you're connecting online. We have to make sure that we are reinforcing what we want that culture and that interaction to be. This makes it a lot easier for people to misinterpret. It makes it a lot easier for me to be succinct and short, that it comes across as rude. That's my personal style that I am not, not the rude part, but they, I am quick to answer and they're short sentences and people sometimes are like, whoa, she's not very friendly. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to plow through 300 emails. Like, you know, it has nothing to do with being friendly or not. We have to instill people about how we want them to interact on those platforms as well. And setting that tone and making sure that everybody understands, you know, that's so important as organizations. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah I, I think it's hard. It's, it's hard to hate up close, right? So when you don't have a real connection, it's easy to come to those assumptions and draw those conclusions. You know, that somebody's rude, they're just not very friendly, you know, or, you know, whatever it is, we're reading between the lines because we don't have enough information to create the whole personality behind it. So I think the tools and the technology, they allow us to get up close. It doesn't have to be in person, just as person said, you know, we can rely on technology to help us get up close and get to know things about each other. It makes it much easier when there is a conflict or or there's just a disagreement, not, not necessarily a conflict, but you need to talk through something. It's so much easier when you have a little more context about people. And, and Becky, you're so right. I think that um, having a photo on your application is as important as having a face-to-face -face meeting. It's the same context, right? You can look someone in the eye and you can feel differently about what's being said and you can look at their photo and you can gain some perspective about who they are as a person. So um, it's a little different, I get it, but it, you're right, it's the world we live in and, and we've got to make the best of it. And I, I think that what was so nice about COVID is that it pushed all of the organizations that suddenly had remote folks to think differently about how online meetings were. So we spent more time online during the pandemic than we used to spend, not just because the, the team moved off site, but our days got longer, which if anybody didn't know that, this is part of why you're so exhausted after two and a half years, right? Um, but a lot of that time was spent with intentional moments that were personal. So it was, you know, let's take that 10 minutes and, you know, connect at the start of a meeting or let's have a happy hour or let's have a, you know, let's all get online and learn how to do something together and be silly, right? Like, you know, I mean, like there were companies that sent out costumes um, for like Friday night free for all or whatever. And I have pictures of my friends that are dressed up as like, little elf ears and, you know, dually bopper thingies on their headbands and, you know, and it was hilarious and funny and it kept them engaged with each other. And it was just really nice to see companies get creative and come up with ways to connect. It, it also makes you connect with your vendors in a different way. A lot of times you would never see them. You would only get a phone call. Well, now, I mean, God, goodness gracious, there is not a phone call that doesn't come with a video camera. Sometimes yeah. I don't welcome that, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we know our vendors better. We're building relationships there. You know, it's, it's really broadened uh, our ability to connect with people in a different way. So yeah. I think even, even with that piece of it, even especially thinking about the vendors, when we talked about that development piece and that that's something people want, I think that technology allows us to make that a little more, e a little easier, right? So you might not have pulled a junior person into a meeting, but it might be easier to have them, you know, sit on a call. It, it, I think it, it allows us to do some of the things that we say we want to do that we just hadn't thought about before. Or that were cost prohibitive. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, the, the last area I'd love to explore a little bit more, and, and Deborah, you gave us the platform when you were talking about your 564 um, and your cultural norms that have been developed and kind of this people first, first and that's the values um, and how important values are in setting culture. Um, you, as you were talking, you said, you know, you started with mission and vision. Um, we at Catapult did the same thing uh, as a brand new organization, starting with our mission and vision. You heard the mission at the top of the hour. You heard our vision to accelerate a world of exceptional workplaces where engaged people drive business success. But we also had to come up with values as an organization. And we did that through a team, cross-functional team, who helped us write our mission and vision. And then we talked about our core values of innovation and integrity, community, excellence, and service, and what this means. And now, um, in our weekly all-hands meeting, we are finding employees who are demonstrating those core values and celebrating them across the company so that everyone can see and can start to emulate that behavior um, I'd love to hear um, from our audience uh, in our final poll, um, if you know your company's values, mm. just a simple yes or no question. Um, and then for our panelists, would like to hear how, um, Deborah, how you are uh, living your values there at Concord Hospitality, and from Kirsten and Becky, how you've heard from other employers uh, that we work with as Catapult members 
how they're living their company values as well. So we've got um, our poll is in. Good to see that um, the vast majority of our attendees do know their company values, um, which I think is important. So let's take it back to our panelists now um, and just touch on this a little bit more. How do we live our values? What are some uh, unique ways to instill those values across the organization? So first of all, I'm impressed with those results. I think if we go to every level in our organization and ask the question, they may not be as resounding. And, and that's in Concord as well. We fight every day to make sure that messaging is consistent. And when I use the words relentless and consistent, you've got to be because it's easy for messaging, like the old telephone, right? It's easy for messaging to get lost. Um, I would say um, me personally living the um, the values of our company integrity is is just so at my core. Um, I'm often referred to as you know the 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 voice or the conscience or you know they know they're going to get the the answer of truth from me and they know even if it's hard and sometimes I do stand alone and you just have to you can't let anything go. Um, I follow every rabbit hole to the end to make sure that things are consistent and fair and upholding our vision and values. So I just think, again, that relentless consistency and pursuit of, um, of your values is important. Emulating, making sure, you know, being that leader by example. And I'll just tell you a quick fun story about our fifth cornerstone, which is fun. Um, we didn't always have that as a defined cornerstone. What we did on our 30th anniversary was say, we're going to roll out another cornerstone. We'd like everyone to guess what it is. So we had multiple su submissions and no one got it, but everyone used the word fun which again goes back to my point, your vision, your values need to be organic. They need to be your DNA. That needs to be who you are long before you ever write it down. So to see that everyone used the word fun, nobody guessed fun, um, was really an affirmation that it is part of who we are and what we like to celebrate as a core value. I love that. And I love that it's part of your DNA. And um, I was on the phone with one of our members, I think a week ago, and they were talking about their values and how they live them every day. And it was a set of values that was developed by employees. So they kind of had employees work, they had the executive team work, they met, they figured out exactly where they were. They were actually pretty close to start out with. They hire based on values. So all of the way that people are trained in order to come into the organization, they are looking for a value fit. To them, it is the most important piece. And we were doing diversity work. We are doing diversity work with them. And one of the things that they wanted to make sure were represented in that course was their values, right? And they wanted to make sure that belonging, the commentary about belonging, was not just that you had a voice and you would be respected, but we picked you because you fit us. Like we know what makes success here at our organization. We know how our heart beats. We know what we need to have teams work together effectively. This is how we screen people. This is how we train people. This is how we talk about people. It's how we live. And I thought that was just such a beautiful way from minute one of an interview all the way through everything that we talk about is we're coming back to our core values because this is such a close knit group and we wanna make sure that everybody represents our same shared vision for what we do. Okay. I worked in a manufacturing environment and I would say 88% of our employees at that time definitely did not know the values. And so we made a very conscious effort that when we had an activity or an event or a bulletin board that we tied the value and we would put, you know, just a little thing in the corner of like, this is the value we're talking about. So maybe it was on defects and we're talking about excellent. You know, maybe it was a fundraiser that we were doing or a can drive. This is how we support community. And we would also ask managers to send cards because I knew they didn't always know. I knew the employees didn't know. So a really cheap, easy way to keep those values in front of people is I just ordered from, you know, an office supply store note cards. And on the front, we put our logo and inside we listed our values. And so when we had somebody who went above and beyond, I would ask the managers, 
grab a card and send very specific what did somebody do to support these and we would mail it to their home and so then we're bringing in the values in front of them their family gets to see it and so we were trying to really get it in front of people in a meaningful way so you know tying it all together not just in the words on the boards but also then into practice that's excellent becky love that and um, we had a question that came into the chat, um, it, which is really kind of how do you train everyone, um, executives all the way down to frontline workers on your mission, vision, values? Um, any any great words of wisdom from any of you before we close out? I love how we're making the values and the mission, vision even part of goal setting, right? So I think that the training Yes, you want to train everybody on what do we mean by these. Let's give examples. Let's let's have teachable moments. Like one of our members in every management meeting that they have, they have a five-minute training session on something that relates back to supporting their mission, their vision, or their values. So it might be that, you know, we're talking about innovation. Well, let's go through a brainstorming technique or something that will help you innovate, or let's go through a problem solving or whatever it is. But they take that time. But then taking it further and trying to figure out like, okay, if innovation is part of your goals or integrity is part of your goals, how do I represent that? Like, what is the thing that I can actually measure and ask you as a contributor to do so you see, ah, this ties back to values, which supports the vision, which makes our mission possible, right? Like, you know, and making that an entire uh, ecosystem that works together. I think it has to flow down from the top, you know, so it, it has to be, you know, walking, walking the talk, the, the leadership has to actually demonstrate those behaviors that are supporting those values. And I think, you know, you can split it up. So from a training standpoint, it doesn't just have to be a let's get together and talk about all these, you know, pick one a month and really focus on it and really look for all the different ways that you support that value throughout the month to help really drill it in as opposed to just, you know, it's it's a checkbox of here's the one item and the one thing we did, you know, but, but it's all these different practices and behaviors to support that. Our hotels do a daily huddle each morning and each afternoon, as many businesses do. So we have a daily connection. Every day we focus and we post it on our app. Um, we post something related to one of our five, six, four categories. And we do too, Becky, to tie them back to the business. And Kristen, how do you bring it full circle? But, and then training is, uh, we do micro learnings and TikToks and, you know, everything else through the app that you can, but it's that consistent um, messaging throughout the day, week, month, year, and that repeat messaging that helps them to sustain the learning, right? Yeah. Well, um, ladies, I am so sorry, but we are running out of time. I feel like we could uh, extend this session for another hour and go deep into many of these topics. Um, Deborah, thank you so much. Uh, for kicking us off. Becky and Kirsten, thank you um, for being part of the conversation on building your culture. Um, this has been yet another um, fantastic Thinking Differently from uh, Catapult. Uh, for those of you who are attending, you will receive information and the recording emailed within the next 48 hours um, so that you can claim your HRCI, SHRM, or CPE credit. Uh, this has been approved for one credit within each of these. And then we hope you will continue to join us for our um, Thinking Differently as well as other series. Coming up next month, we have a session on improving benefits while reducing the cost of the ever important healthcare costs for employers. Um, our Thinking Differently webinar coming up in August on August 10th. And then we have our signature HR leadership conference, which will be held in person in Charlotte on Thursday, uh, September 29th and Friday the 30th. Registration will be open in just a few weeks. Uh, we are jam packing that conference with a lot of things around learning and development, total rewards, culture, attracting and retaining talent. That is something you won't wanna miss. So we will hope to see you there. Um, to our panelists, thank you for being here. And to all of our attendees, thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, let's catapult. Let's go higher. Have a great day, everyone.